Arthur Blank, the owner of the Atlanta Falcons, bought the team nearly 20 years ago, issued a statement, the only statement that came from anyone with the Falcons organization regarding the guy that they traded up in round one 10 years ago to get, one of the great players in the history of the franchise. There's a statement there. We also have the full text of it at PFT. Chris, I thought it was interesting that there was no statement from GM Terry Fontenot or from head coach Arthur Smith. Just something perfunctory. Fontenot's been with the Saints. I I know firsthand the difficulty that Julio Jones creates for an opposing team. We uh, yeah, yada yada yada. Period. Yeah, end of release. I hear you. Arthur Smith, my former team, the Titans, is getting a great competitor. We've studied him. We've competed with him. But yeah, something perfunctory that just is like, hey, here we go. I I think that it wasn't an accident that both guys were silent. And this gets to the point that we were talking about earlier. Why we didn't see the Falcons make an overt effort to try to trade Julio Jones until the Monday of draft week. Remember the Monday of draft week. That's when three different reporters all had the same thing. What a coincidence. No, it wasn't. The Falcons pulled the cord on the lawnmower to try to get something lined up for Julio Jones. It would have been effective June two. And you're right, Chris, if they would have started this back in late February, early March, maybe somebody would have said, Hey, uh, okay, fine. We can wait until June too. I mean, look at what the Giants paid Kenny Galladay. Yeah. You think if the Giants could have gotten Julio Jones instead of Kenny Galladay, they may have thought maybe this is better for us. All due respect to right. Kenny Galladay. Right. I mean, if we're concerned about hamstring injuries, crap. The, the Galladay had worse of a hamstring problem last year than Julio Jones. Missed more games than Julio Jones last year. So I agree with you. They could have gotten that first round pick if they had started sooner. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. Based upon what I know. And now what I think. Yeah. I think they were trying to work it out with him. And one of the things I'm told is he just would not engage with the new head coach. No taking calls, no responding to text messages. And, you know, they understand the value of having Julio Jones on the team. And I think they didn't work their way through the anger, denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance until right before the draft where it's like, hey, guys, we got to have a plan here. What's our plan? Okay, our plan is let's start trying to find a trade partner now, effective June 2, and they came to that conclusion right before the Monday of draft week. Before that, I think they were holding out hope that they could make it all work, and who knows what they would have done with the fourth overall pick if they thought they were keeping Julio Jones around. But I think that's why they didn't move any sooner because they were were hopeful they could find a way to mend the fence, and they finally woke up right before the week of the draft – and said, we just can't. We got to move on. Yeah, may, maybe. You know, maybe maybe that's what it is. If that is the case, though, you know, it's, it's just, you know, not a great job in reading the tea leaves of the situation. I'll say that much. I mean, yes, because, you know, again, they pigeonholed themselves a little bit. Yeah, free agency was over. Oh, we're going to hope. I hope we can work this out. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. You know, the, again, I, I think at some point, maybe early on there, you just got to pull the cord and go, wait, we're new. There's something he doesn't like here. He wants he doesn't want to be a part of this new change in a place he's been at it a long time. So he's looking for a total change. And that's where you just got to rip the Band-Aid off and, and do something tough there. So if that's the way it went down, hey, then you you're, certainly can still blame Atlanta in that situation for maybe not being a little more aggressive earlier on in the, in the situation. But they're stuck. And I I understand them not putting out a comment, Mike. I do, just to to reference that real quick. They have no relationship with them. And like you just said, there's been no real conversations or contact. And they probably feel a little bit, you know, disrespected to a degree. Not that they're going to take it real personal because it's not personal. But at the end of the day, they're human beings. They're going, wait, we got here. And now he says he doesn't want to be here. So And we never got a chance to really sell ourselves to him. So that's probably why we don't hear a quote from them either. Well, I just know from experience that when there's a big transaction like this, the press release has yeah, a quote from everyone. Right. You're right. Something. Right. One line. It is rare. Right. Rare. PR right. writes it. The coach looks at it and says, okay, or otherwise grunts, and that's the, the statement that's put out on his behalf. Happens all the time. I, I think in this case they were deliberately omitted from the process because he didn't engage with the new regime, and Arthur Blank had to, had to say something. Somebody had to say something, so it was Blank. And look – Let's not 
understate the influence of Blank on all of this. And one of the reasons why maybe they didn't do it sooner. That's right. Blank wanted that first round pick. That's Blank right. wanted that first round pick. And, you know, you, you got to figure out how to properly navigate life with a billionaire who can fire you at any moment. Not, not that he's just walking around arbitrarily firing people like Russell Dalrymple backstage at the Seinfeld pilot. But I know it gets more and more obscure every year. But I, I, I think that they had to convince Arthur Blank to stand down from his expectation that he was getting a first round pick. Yeah. And it took him a while to do it. And eventually he did Blank. And, you know, I wrote that story yesterday and it's like, you know, anytime, anytime you, you give a little poke to a billionaire, you never know what the blowback's going to be. But it's the truth. He blinked. And this deal wasn't getting done until he blinked, unless they were going to follow a strategy, Chris, like the one that we had discussed last week, where you find a way to hold Julio Jones until somebody gets into the season and somebody gets intoxicated by their Super Bowl potential and somebody says, then fine, we'll give you a first round pick for this guy because we think we're going to be drafting low in round one anyway. Yeah, well, that's where the risk was, though, right? That's where I can't fault them for making this trade right now because, yeah, doing what you're talking about certainly like would have given them the best chance to maybe maximize what you could get for Julio Jones when it all said and done. But, I mean, also, yeah, I don't know. Somebody falls on his leg and he breaks his ankle in week one. And no, I, but he doesn't show up. Oh, or doesn't we, show up. Yeah, that, what if they have an agreement? Aspect. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Where, where, where they work out a deal right. where he stays away and they just put him on ice. But, but the thing is, who's going to pay him? That people are going to so feel not feel comfortable. Yeah. Yes, right. There's going to be an uncomfortable aspect there. They were stuck as far as yeah. the situation is right now. And, Mike, like, I think your point there is very real, and I wish I would have brought that up. Like, the, fo- the point of maybe why they weren't aggressive earlier on in free agency, see, these are things I don't know. I haven't heard enough rumors here or things in the, in the know yet to know, but maybe that Fontenot and Arthur Smith were going to be aggressive early on in free agency. Maybe Arthur Blank was the one that said, wait, I think I could smooth this over and make it work. So maybe they wait for him. You know, those are the dynamics we don't know. And that's why I certainly don't want to blame anybody. And that's why I say, yeah, it doesn't look great. But I think for the situation it is right now, I think Atlanta did as good as they could have done. You're talking about a new GM, yep. a new head coach, right. an owner who's had the team 20 years, and your guy Rich McKay, the guy who drafted you in 2003 yeah. when he was the GM of the Buccaneers, as kind of the liaison. And and that's a name that, that never gets mentioned in this. But I guarantee you Rich McKay had a huge influence on how this went down because he's the one, I believe, who would be going to Arthur Blank to have these, these delicate conversations about when – and if they need to abandon their insistence on getting a first-round pick for Julio Jones. And, you know, from the Titans' perspective, Chris, I thought of this last segment, and and maybe this is one of the arguments that the Falcons made to try to get a first-round pick. Number one, it is going to be a low first-round pick most likely, so it's basically a second-round pick, so just give us your first-round pick. Oh, and by the way, you wasted a first-round pick last year on Isaiah Wilson. I, I wonder how much... The, the Wilson experience was a factor in trade talks and how much it contributed to Tennessee's decision to say, hey, these are all crap shoots. Yeah, we, we don't know. We found out firsthand right. with Isaiah Wilson. Why not send, as Torrey Smith pointed out, a draft pick for a proven commodity because you always take the proven commodity over the unscratched lottery ticket. Yes. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You, you do. And I, maybe maybe it did. It certainly did. I mean, John Robinson's really smart. I don't want to say it certainly did, but I think it just goes back to the old adage of like, okay, wait, yeah, there's a little bit of injury history. He's a little older, but he's Julio Jones, and we know what he is and how great he is and everything he can bring to the table as compared to, you know, like you're saying, a crapshoot there for, for Julio Jones. You know, just all of it, all of it's good for – for the Tennessee Titans. Uh, that That's where I look at it. Other than they just got to figure out some cap things. And, yeah, you're going to have to maybe pay him some big money if he has a big year or something like that. But that's probably a problem they welcome as well. I, I mean, that that's what they're hoping for here. But I just think some of the moves they made in free agency and now, like, Julio goes to a place where – you know, it's just a better setup for him altogether in every aspect. The team's better. 
I believe Ryan Tannehill's better than Matt Ryan, and he's a better down-the-field thrower, so that's going to benefit Julio. And unlike in, in Atlanta, where there's no run game to speak of right now or anything like that, I think even statistically, this place is better for Julio to then you know, make more money and do all that. So everything makes sense from Julio's standpoint. And other than the contract situation, to me, everything makes sense from the Tennessee Titans standpoint as well. I, I, I made the remark yeah. privately on Saturday that we were officially at the point in the Julio Jones life cycle where there was nothing further to report when someone from ESPN reported that Julio Jones wants a guy with a big arm who can throw the ball down the field. Gee, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, I thought he wanted a guy with a pop gun arm, Chris. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.